What was the Stoic formula for living the good life? When was the idea of moral duty conceived? And why was its invention so controversial? Hello, this is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom. You are listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today I'm speaking with Jack Vizhnik, also known as Lantern Jack, host of the Ancient Greece Declassified podcast and director of research at the Anasoclosis Institute. He is also the author of the new book, The Invention of Duty, Stoicism as Deontology. But before we begin, a quick thank you to our Classical Wisdom Society members who make this podcast possible. If you would like to become a society member and help support the classics, please go to classicalwisdom.com and click start here. Now, on to why the Stoics didn't have rules, but one formula on how to choose the best course in life. The Invention of Duty, Stoicism as Deontology. So, you've written a book about moral duty in the ancient world. Uh, I think probably the best place to begin then is with what exactly is moral duty in the first place? Great question. So a duty is something that you are obligated to do. You have to do it for some reason. And a moral duty uh, is probably best explained by contrast with other types of duty. So a moral duty is not a legal duty, which would be enforced by laws. It's not a religious duty, which might be enforced by God's commandments or by a church. It's not a civic duty, which is something you must do, which is expected of you by the political community that you belong to. A moral duty has no external source of compulsion. It's something that you, you know, you feel it in your heart or you think through it and you come to the conclusion that you have to do it because it's the right thing. And that's the only reason why you have to do it. So you, you're talking about moral duty in the ancient world. And so I was sort of reading the intro to your book uh, and there's a great sort of blurb that says, according to the prevailing view, ancient ethical systems lacked any sense of moral obligation and were built instead around notions of virtue and human flourishing. So when you're talking about moral duty, did the ancients have kind of a sense of moral duty? Uh, how, how have people kind of historically viewed the morality systems in the ancient world? Well, the simplest way I've heard scholars explain the difference between ancient Greek and Roman ethics on the one hand and uh, modern approaches to ethics on the other, and by modern I mean like 1500 AD and later, is to say that ancient ethics revolves around the central fundamental question, um, what is the good life? How can I lead a virtuous and happy life? Whereas modern ethics starts with the fundamental question, what should I do? Or in other words, what is my duty? And I think that's a great first order approximation of the difference. But I also think that scholars have gone a little too far in thinking that the ancient ethical schools were so concerned and focused on the good life and on virtuous living that they never ask the question, what is it my duty to do? And I think that in particular, the Stoics did ask that question. They were very much concerned with the notion of duty. And so that's what I um, argue in my book. And I try to explain what that notion meant for them and you know what their theory was. So I kind of thinking just to put it in context of the society, uh, the kind of ancient Greek societies were often sort of honor and shame based, right? Like it was basically on how your actions were in regards to how people viewed you versus I think Christian societies are very guilt based. Is the moral duty, some, if it, is it sort of like an internal checking of morality versus an external societal value? Does that make sense, that question? <laughs> no, that is, that is interesting. I mean, I think you're right that uh, when you look at the archaic and classical period, so up until, let's say, 320 BC, um, the predominant kind of uh, negative moral check on people's actions is shame as opposed to guilt. And if you fast forward to the Christian era and the modern times, um, it's more guilt as opposed to shame. Um, 
and what I, you know, that that shift is happening at the same time with other shifts as well. For example, the notion of evil doesn't really exist as its own thing in the early times, but then it comes to be a very important concept later. So you have these uh, several different parallel trends that are happening. And the Hellenistic period, which is the kind of intervening period between those two eras, is largely unknown to us. I mean, very few complete texts survive from that period. It, the way I often describe this is, and we have a great high definition picture of classical Athens. And we have a great high definition picture of the Roman Republic um, centuries later. And in between that, it's like the train of civilization entered a tunnel for a few hundred years and then emerged. And during that time, we have very few relatively speaking texts. And so I wanted to understand what was happening in that time period that led to those changes. One of the changes is the shift from um, you know, shame to guilt as a predominant uh, concept. And I think that the idea of duty arises as part of that um, you know, gradual shift in morality as well. So out of the sort of Hellenistic time period, who, I mean, because the Hellenistic period is, I mean, it is very fascinating in that also it covers a huge number of people over a great wide expanse uh, with many different cultures. It's quite diverse and multicultural time period. Um, so this sense of moral duty, who's sort of bringing that to the fore out of all these plentiful of peoples spread across the whole region? So in my view, it's the Stoics who are the pioneers of this concept. And you're right, it very much has to do with this new cosmopolitan world that emerges after the, con after the conquests of Alexander the Great. So before Alexander, most Greeks lived in city-states in polis. And therefore, the philosophies that emerged, such as the, you know, the systems of Plato and Aristotle, are very much um, centered around the idea of the polis. The good life, the virtuous life is the life of a good citizen who you know, contributes to the well-being of the polis. After Alexander the Great conquers most of the known world to the Greeks, uh, the polis kind of um, is in decline. You, know, you have these huge kingdoms that emerge and people no longer can look to local politics as a source of sovereignty and identity. Um, they kind of feel lost in this new huge cosmopolitan world that that expanded their horizons and the stoics come along at that time right after the you know at the, at the dawn of the hellenistic era and they take a lot of the principles that plato and aristotle had established but they update them for a cosmopolitan world and they say you know what we're actually all members all humans are citizens of one global community of one cosmic polis and since we're all members of a cosmic polis, we're all bound by, you know, cosmic laws, as it were. And therefore, we all have, we're all bound by the same normative principle, which is duty. So but didn't Socrates say I'm neither Greek nor Athenian, but a citizen of the world? Well, so there is, a, so Diogenes apparently said that. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> I knew I'd be wrong somewhere. <laughs> And he is also operating in this uh, around the same time that the Stoics are, um, well, he's a little bit before them. But that, that quote is often misinterpreted because, I mean, we, I don't know if we want to go there, but Diogenes was citizenless. I mean, he had lost his citizenship because he and his dad apparently were caught forging fake money. Um, so they were expelled from their city and, and were no longer citizens and being a citizen was really important in the in the ancient world so people used to taunt diogenes and say hey like what's your passport bro and you know his <laughs> his comeback was oh i'm a citizen of the world so you know it's not clear if he really had a cosmopolitan you know well like robust well established philosophical framework for saying that or if it was just a comeback so you're so with the Stoics have been influenced by Diogenes's comment, or no? Um, probably, probably. Uh, you know, it, it's hard. We don't really have the early Stoic writings. Like the Stoa um, was founded by Zeno of Kidium from Cyprus in around 300 BC, and uh, after him there were, you know, a series of leaders of the school. And we don't have any writings from 
like the first six or seven leaders of the Stoic school. We only have our first source that's complete is Cicero, who's writing um, two and a half centuries later. So we really can't um, know exactly how much the early Stoics were influenced by Diogenes, but it's very possible. So you're so we're getting back to this sort of the idea of duty um, and kind of how the Stoics came to understand it. One is this idea of moral duty sort of confined to the Stoics, or were other people kind of coming to this conclusion at the same time as well? That is a great and difficult question. And actually, if I may just add something about Diogenes, I actually uh, they definitely were quite influenced by him because. Diogenes founded the so-called Cynic school and Zeno, we know, before founding Stoicism was a Cynic, a student of the Cynics. And so in a sense, Stoicism is, is like the hardcore cynicism of Diogenes, like living in a barrel, living in poverty and saying, you know, I don't care about the material things in the world, plus the component of duty, you know? so. Yes, you shouldn't care about money that much, but you should still, you know, you still have certain duties. You should still take care of your family. You should still do, have a job if you can. You should still participate in politics if you can. Um, so there is more of an influence there. Now, were other societies or were, were other schools uh, moving towards a notion of duty? Um, again, hard to say, but what we do know is that the Stoics popularized this concept very well, so very effectively. So before the Stoics, the the term katheikon, which for them I claim means duty, um, was a very, very rare word, but they made it into an everyday word. And so by the Roman era, you have uh, Aristotelian philosophers and um, you know academic philosophers using that word as well. Okay, so let's get onto this word then. So, because I think this is sort of part of the premise of understanding what this stoic concept of duty is. So can you maybe explain why you claim this is a word that uh, says what it says? Yeah, so the question of whether um, the stoics and the ancients in general had a notion of duty really revolves around this one word, which in Greek is kathekon and in Latin later it gets translated as officium. And the question is, what does this mean? Most scholars in the past century have thought it meant um, appropriate action, which would mean that it is a normative concept. It does tell us what you know we should do, but it's a very weak concept. It's much weaker to say that something is appropriate than to say that it is your duty. But interestingly, before 1900, scholars thought that it was duty. You know, uh, there was this. You know, when Kant read the Stoics in around 1800, he thought they were talking about duty. Uh, so this changed in the late 1800s for a few philosophical arguments that we need not get into right now. Um, but it was basically, un the meaning of the term was not scrutinized again until now. So for the past 120 years, um, no one has actually gone and done a philological search, you know, go through every case where this word appears and look at the texts and see what can we infer about the meaning. And that's what I did when I was uh, starting this project. I, um, you know, back in the day, this would have taken years to do, but now we have these amazing digital tools where you can just search for a word. And since all the ancient texts have been digitized, you can find instantly all the occurrences. So I you know, instantly found all the times this word appears in the ancient sources. And I spent probably half a year going through all of them carefully. And you know, that's a kind of long overdue project that needed to be done. And I make the case and I now have it in the end of the book in the appendix, but uh, I think you can make a very clear case that this word actually must be much stronger in its binding force than mere appropriate action. It really means something that you have to do it's obligatory and it is your duty. And therefore, I think we can say from this philological study that the Stoics definitely had a notion of duty. Okay, I've got to ask two questions. One, how many times was this word used? Before the Stoics, so in the pre-Hellenistic period, 
that is the archaic and classical period, it's rare. It only appears maybe 25 times. So that's a very manageable um, data set to work with. And then, and then it blows up, of course. Uh, but the most important cases are the earlier ones. So if you can establish what it meant before the Stoics came on the scene, then you can establish what the term was that the Stoics inherited, as it were. And that can be securely, the meaning of that can be securely established as something of strong obligation. And then uh, in the Hellenistic period, there are many, many sources, many, many occasions where this word comes up and the usage there seems to be consistent with the early sense of something that is obligatory. Um, so the second question I want to ask, wait, but do you have like a number for how many times it was used since the Stoics, like in your database? I'm like, or uh, magnitude, like a hundred. I think, okay. I think it was, 5, I think it's like 250 in, um, in the, I mean, it, you could, you could continue your search all the way to the fall of Constantinople because all those texts have been digitized in the same database and that will just be unmanageable. But in the, you know, classical Hellenistic period, maybe, um, early Roman period, I think it's about 250 or so cases. Uh, and so the next question I have is, if it kind of meant more like the moral duty up until about 120 years ago, why did it, why did this word change course and become less meaningful 120 years ago? What happened? Great question. So there seems to have been um, the, the same shift happened both in Germany and in England for different reasons. So the German scholars of the 1890s, um, they looked at this one passage, this one fragment that we have that claims that Zeno, who founded Stoicism, uh, he, he derived or he coined or established the word kathekon uh, from the phrase kata tinas heikain, which is a really puzzling Greek phrase, which can mean a million different things um, because the preposition kata can mean a million different things. And, you know, so- This is where translation it, gets fun, right? And gets exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. So the German scholars of the 1890s concluded that this means something like, um, duty comes from the phrase that which approaches one or that which is in accordance with one's nature. And that didn't seem like, either way you read it, didn't seem like an obligatory meaning. And then meanwhile, in England, it was a scholar who looked at, you know, Cicero's description of the Stoic view of how duties arise in, in, a, um, in a human or even in an animal. And that was a problem that animals also have cafe conta, because we would not say in English that an animal has a duty. And plants also have cafe conta, and we would not say in English that plants have duties. So that was a problem. And so he concluded that this cannot be duty because you know animals and plants have it. And because the Stoics say that that a baby human's first cafe con or a ficium is to preserve its own um, constitution, its own integral self. So that differed from modern discussions of duty. And so based on those, you know, the German approach and the that English scholar, people said, okay, this, this must be a different concept. Now in in my book, I I re-examined both of those arguments. On the one hand, that phrase from Zeno, uh Katati Nas Heken, which again we don't know we don't have Zeno's explanation of that phrase. We just have that phrase. Uh, again, using these modern digital tools, I searched every one of those words to see all the possible ways it can be used to create meanings. And I came up with a new um, explanation, understanding of that phrase, which makes it seem more like duty. And uh, that was not my intention, by the way. I wasn't trying to prove it was duty. I actually didn't think it meant duty originally, but based on a careful study of those phrases, I, I came to the conclusion that that phrase actually means that which has been put before you. And there's this stoic idea that the providence of nature places tasks before us. So we don't need to go searching for our duty in some faraway country at any moment in time, the providence of nature places before us exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And then the, as, as for the animal and plant 
problem. Yes, the concept of katheko or fikium is not exactly the modern notion of duty because it's broad enough that it can be applied to plants and animals. But the idea is that all living creatures have tasks or activities that the providence of nature has put before them, as it were. And in the case of humans, those things are you know, moral and virtuous actions that we are obligated to do. So in the case of humans, at least, um, kathekonda and nofikia really do correspond to the modern notion of duty. So sticking with the humans, because I think we might find a bit more of a more important to, information to gather from what humans' is, moral duties are than plants. So maybe that would be interesting in and of itself. I don't know. <laughs> so to stick to humans, um, how did the Stoics then define moral duty? Like what, what was sort of encompassed in that concept? Like what, how do you know what they felt was they should be doing? So before the Stoics, if you look at, for example, you know, the Socratic dialogues where Socrates is deliberating what, you know, what he should do, should he, um, should he escape from prison when he's offered that opportunity or should he drink the comium and, and die? Um, he considers various deliberative strands. So various ways of deliberating, what should I do? And he asks, you know, what would the courageous thing to do be? What would the wise thing to do be? What would the pious thing to do be? Um, so before the Stoics, there were multiple virtues and multiple avenues with which you could deliberate what you should do. And there was never the implication that there's only one right thing. You know, there might be the, the wise thing and the courageous thing might be two separate things. The Stoics bring together all of the virtues under one umbrella and say, actually, at every moment in time, there's exactly one thing that is your duty to do. And if you, and all the, all the virtues point to that same thing. So the um, Stoic philosopher Panaitius said that the virtues are like a bunch of archers who are all aiming at the same target, which is your duty. And so um, it is good to consider what the virtue, what the wise thing to do is and what the courageous thing to do is, et cetera. But all those things will point you to the same thing, which is your duty. And before the Stoics, there was never the idea that you're under some obligation at all times. You know, like for Plato and Aristotle, the idea of leisure or scole, where we get the word school from, um, which actually meant leisure, was crucial. It was important for the philosophically minded person to have free time to just chill out and contemplate things and be under no obligation. But for the Stoics, you are never free from the bounds of duty. It might be your duty to take time off. It might be your duty to take a nap. But at any one time, there is exactly one thing that all the different virtues point to, and that is your duty. So what is your duty? Is there like a universal duty? Or does everybody have the same duty? Or does your does your duty change throughout the day? You know, how do we define what is the duty? So this has been a, a big puzzle uh, for, for forever, you know, <laughs> um, ever since Adam Smith and theory of moral sentiments accused the, the Sto or blamed the Stoics for not laying down enough rules to guide our behavior. And so even, even during the past century, when scholars thought that kathekon and afikium meant appropriate action, there was still the question, well, what is your appropriate action? What is your kathekon or afikium? And for the longest time, people thought that the Stoics must be using a rule-based system because they seem to offer some rules. They seem to say at some points, you know, obey your parents, honor your country, you know, help, help your neighbor out if need be. So those seem to be rules. And so for the longest time, people thought this is a rule-based system. And that raised a lot of problems because for every single rule that we find in the sources, we also find an exception to that rule. For example, yes, you should obey your parents, but if your parents are preventing you from doing philosophy, in that case alone, you're allowed to disobey them because the good life and the philosophical life are one and the same. And so, you know, you kind of have the... <laughs> you can only disobey them for philosophy. I mean, they could be tyrants, yes. murderous, horrible people. You should still obey unless they stop you from philosophy. Well, actually, so another, another case is the tyrant. So if your father is, is working to 
um, destroy the state and become a tyrant, again, according to Cicero, that is, um, that makes it your duty to actually, uh, well, he doesn't quite say kill your father because that would be taboo. He says to put the health of the state above the health of your father. So, uh, so no every, anarchist stoics either. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> um, every rule we find has these exceptions. And so what do you, what do you make of that? That's been a huge puzzle. Um, more recently, scholars have, have, have tended to think that maybe there, is, there are no fixed rules. And in that case, what, how do you find your duty? So in my book, I tried to answer this question and I was looking for, you know, through the sources for an answer. And I came upon a passage in Cicero that said that since duties change all the time, depending on the circumstances, depending on individual character, you know, different people, the Stoics say that two different people with different characters in the exact same situation might have different duties. So Cicero says, since that's the case, we need a formula. That's the Latin words the same as in English, formula. So we need a formula to help us determine what that duty is. And so I started looking for the formula. And after, you know, uh, many, many months and even years of com comparing all the different sources, um, <clears throat> I noticed the same, uh, the same pieces of advice and the same methods and same principles could be found across the different sources. And when you put them together, you do actually start to see this formula, or maybe you could call it an algorithm that you that takes inputs that are, you know, your character and your the situation you're in, your options available to you, and it kind of spits out what your duty is. So they have a very flexible system that takes into account the particularities of individual um, human characters and backgrounds and situations. So you got me on tender hooks. So I mean, you're basically saying, okay, here's this one formula about how you're actually supposed to live your life at any given moment, in any given situation, that was determined by the Stoics. And like, you know, here's the algorithm. What what is the algorithm? Well, it's it's very complicated, <clears throat> but I'll give you some uh, some of my favorite aspects of it. So the first step to determining your duty is to not rush into any action, you know, pause for a moment and think because one of the principles of duty is that it is that which reason commands that we do. So, you know, don't rush into any action, pause, consider, think, but also don't wait too long to act because the other twin flaw is, is negligence, right? If you fail to act, okay? Now, in many cases, we only have a few limited options available to us, you know, like, should I eat this piece of cake or not? Or should I go to the gym or not? Or should I give my friend a ride or not, right? Those are dilemmas. And in those cases, um, we can often just think, which of these is the virtuous thing to do? And we have pretty strong intuitions about that. So if you are you know, an athlete, it's, you have a pretty strong intuition that eating that piece of cake is probably not the virtuous thing to do. So in a lot of dilemmas, you can simply solve the dilemma by thinking, what would the virtuous thing to do be? And the key here is that no amount of money or riches or comfort should ever trump virtue. If you're offered a billion dollars to kill somebody, you're not allowed to say, well, you know, I could save 50 more lives with that billion dollars if I just killed this one person. That's not allowed because um, no amount of money can ever, um, you know, outweigh the viciousness or lack of virtue of killing somebody. So, and this sounds like it's also solving the train trolley dilemma as well. Uh, oof, that's that. <laughs> that's that's too tricky. I think for now, <laughs> let's not go there. Um, but that would be actually interesting to have a, a kind of stoic take on the trolley problem. But uh, the problem then is, what if, what if you have many options? What if you have hundred different options, you know, like you could, you know, you, you could go to a different country and help the poor, or you could help your neighbor, right? How do you weigh those options? And for that, um, since again, the Stoics believe that all virtues aim at the same goal, you know, in each case, you kind of pick the virtue that's easiest or most intuitive to think about. And one of those that's most intuitive is the virtue of decorum or propriety. And uh, you know, as Cicero says, we all 
when we're watching like a movie and some actor says something that's out of character we instantly sense that like no like batman batman would never do that or like you know superman would never do that so this is on the words of cicero here right now right yeah of course yeah <laughs> For him, it's like Thyestes and Oedipus, <laughs> right? Um, so we have this intuitive sense of what is appropriate to different characters. And so we can use that in, in thinking about what's appropriate to our character. And that will be a powerful tool to point us to our duty. And the way to do that is to think through our roles in life. Uh, some people call this role ethics. So there are many ways to do this, um, but Cicero offers this one very powerful framework where he says, think of your roles as falling under four personas. Your first persona is that of a rational and social human being. Your second persona is that is the nature that's given to you. So for him, that might be that you're a man or a woman or you're tall or short. And the third persona is that which chance has given you. So that might be, you know, you're born rich or you're born poor, or you have a great reputation or a bad reputation for the Stoics that was largely out of your control. Um, and then the fourth persona is the sum total of your choices. So this is especially your profession in life, you know, the vocation you have chosen and other choices as well. And you want, so you want to act in a way that's consistent with all of those personas. And if, and if you think through them all, you, you, again, you narrow down your options because you cancel out all kinds of different, um, you know, options that you have. So if something is you can't kill somebody because that would be going against their first persona of a rational and social being. You know, if, if your fourth persona again is if you've chosen to be an athlete, then, you know, you need to go to the gym and you need to not eat cheesecake every day. You know, that's consistent with your fourth persona. So by thinking through these things, you narrow down your options and there are many other tools as well, but they all fall into this kind of systematic approach you can take where you consider question of virtue, you cut through dilemmas, you um, consider your own roles in life and all these different things, narrow down your options and point you to the final goal, which is your duty. Can you, have you written out this like exact equation somewhere? Yeah, uh, I have it in a chart in the book. <laughs> that would be really awesome to look at. I think that would be really interesting yeah. to sort of visualize exactly how we're supposed to make um, Choices. So this concept of duty then that, that is sort of underlying the sort of stoic principles. Um, how did this sort of concept continue on after the stoics? I mean, do we see evidence of it today? I think the stoic concept was so influential that we're still using it. Um, so after the stoics, the stoics made this term again, katheikon in Greek and aphikium in Latin into an everyday ethical term. So it was picked up by Aristotelian philosophers and it was also picked up by um, both Jewish and Christian writers in the first centuries of the common era. So in the, you know, in the Latin West, uh, Ambrose famously writes a work, De Officiis, uh, On Duties, which is inspired by Cicero's work of the same name, which is inspired by the Stoic works. And in the Greek East, the um, you know, Christian fathers pick up this notion of katheikon and, and a lot of the Stoic machinery, uh, philosophical machinery becomes embedded in later Christian theology. So then, you know, fast forward, this carries through the Middle Ages and fast forward to the late 18th century when Kant, you know, Immanuel Kant, the German enlightenment thinker is often thought of as the pioneer of the concept of moral duty. But he actually says in the beginning of his book, The Groundwork, on the metaphysics of morals that he's appealing to the common notion of duty so he's actually inheriting this notion which mediated by the christian middle ages ultimately comes from the stoics and then fast forward to today you know we still speak of doing the right thing and we have this idea in our head that there is a, oh you did the right thing right like there wasn't there weren't many options there wasn't like the courageous thing or the just thing or the patient thing there was the right thing and you did it so uh, that, I mean, you can credit or blame the Stoics for that way of thinking that we still use today. So you've been referencing a lot of Cicero um, and you've been mentioning that, you know, this kind of goes back to the Stoics, but you, you, you uh, explained previously that we don't really have much writing on the Stoics 
to begin with. So where are you, how are you able to find this formula? Is it mostly based on Cicero and later writers referencing the Stoics or, or were there some original sources you could go to? Um, where were you able to sort of delve and get to this information? Well, um, there are many components that would have to go through to answer that question. Um, a lot of it is in Cicero, some of it is in Seneca. We also have the Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, other Roman Stoics. And we also have uh, two summaries of Stoic ethics in Greek, as well as one summary of Stoic ethics in Latin, again, given by Cicero. So we have a, a bunch of different sources. And um, part of the work in reconstructing that formula is just going through all those sources very carefully, putting the pieces together. The reason why that hasn't been done, I think, is that for the longest time, scholars were operating under the assumption that Stoicism is a rule-based system. And so they were trying to figure out, you know, how are, how do you get your duty from, or sorry, how do you get your appropriate action for them from these rules that the Stoics offer, but they also offer counterexamples. And they were trying to figure out, is there some kind of rule case deduction where you take the rule and you look at its exceptions and then you infer from that when it actually is valid and then you look for other rules that are valid in other cases so it wasn't really until the past 15 years that scholars established that actually there are no rules there's not a single rule that holds true at all cases and it's only when you realize that that you find the need to find another system another explanation for how the stoics expect you to um to find your duty and so the question really only arose in recent scholarship. And I was building on the work of other scholars in, in looking for this. And um, it's, I mean, the short answer is that it was basically through years of very carefully looking at all the sources, following the leads, you know, when Cicero says we need a formula, what a formula in Latin, what does he mean there? What is the formula? That's also a big debate. So when Cicero says we need a formula, Again, most scholars looked to looked for the first thing after he says that, that looks like a rule. But that can't be right because there are no fixed rules. And the whole point of the formula that he says, that the reason why we need a formula is that rules don't work. So I had to broaden the search for his offered formula. And I think that if you look at the next, you know, four or five pages after he says that, that's what the formula is. It's a collection of tools, a collection of, um, doctrines, right? And when you see that, then that also connects to the first book of Dofikis where he talks about those four personas. And, and then you can find, you know, again, when you realize that the formula is something more than just a rule, then you can find a similar passage in, in Seneca, where again, people were looking for a rule, but if you broaden the scope to a larger passage, that actually fits very well with Cicero. So it seems to confirm that we're on the same page here. And so, yeah, it's a, uh, again, it's something that arose as a result of the recent scholarship that, that has determined that rules are not what the stoicism, the stoic system is working under. And um, just putting the pieces together over many years of careful study, I think does reveal that there is a formula and that you don't need rules. You can calculate your duty in any case. So what's the significance of saying that there's no rules? I mean, is what are the implications of that? Just being like, okay, we don't have rules. We have a formula instead. Is that the kind of idea? Just a mind shift difference? That's a great question and a very difficult one. And first of all, let me just say that the Stoics did believe in laws that they thought that you should follow the laws of the state you're born into. You know, that's, that is the part of the third persona, you know, chance or, or fate or whatever you want to call it. Had you born into a certain political system and as such, you should follow the laws. On the other hand, they did believe that um, that reason is able to discover the right thing to do in all cases. And they did also believe that no, you know, written code of laws could ever fully encapsulate morality, you know, like, so they, they have all these interesting thought experiments where they go through all of society's strictest laws and taboos and show that there are exceptions to them. And, and this actually was used against them. You know, so for example, there's this, if you read 
later Christian sources, they're often hostile to the Stoa. And because we don't have the early Stoic writings, we rely on the later Christian as well as later Platonic writings. And they will take things out of context. Like they'll say, oh, the Stoics claimed that incest is great, that you should, that you, should uh, you know, have ancestral relations. Now, in that case, we actually do have the original fragment, okay? And that's not what the Stoics said. The Stoics said, yes, there is this custom or law that you should not engage in incest. But what if there's like a post-apocalyptic scenario where the entire human race has been wiped out except for one man and his daughter? And the only way for the human race to you know, re rebuild itself would be for incest to happen. In that case, would it be Kathekon for you know, the man and his daughter to have children? So first of all, they're not saying that you should engage in incest. And they're not even like, it's a, it's a hypothetical question based on a hypothetical scenario that's meant to make you question the received strict rules of your society. And so by means of such thought experiments, they, they, they wanted to show that all you know, hard and fast rules may be useful in a legal framework, but the ultimate authority for morality is human reason and human reason cannot be encoded in written rules. That's an awesome answer. Thank you. I like it. Well, uh, maybe we should finish up there because I think that's a great spot um, and switch gears to talk a bit more about yourself for a moment. Um, you've been running a podcast as well. Uh, maybe you can tell our listeners a little bit about uh, Ancient Greece Declassified and what sort of your aim is with your podcast. Yeah, thanks. So my show is called Ancient Greece Declassified, as you said. And it shares your mission of bringing ancient knowledge and ancient wisdom to modern minds. It's great. It's a great uh, mission that I, I like how you phrase it. And um, we've covered a lot of different topics. I also mainly do interviews as you do. And recently, the project I've been working on is a multi episode series on Plato's Republic. The Republic is a fascinating and difficult and enigmatic philosophical work. Um, and I think that it has a lot of interesting lessons that are especially relevant to today's world of, um, you know, polarized politics. So that's the current project. And, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see where it goes. Awesome. Well, um, how long have you been doing the podcast for? Since 2016. Oh, wow. Very good. Yeah, it's been, been a while. I can't believe how time flies. And uh, can everyone find you on all the various platforms or there, where's the best spot to find you? Yeah, um, I mean, of course I have Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Um, you can usually just search Ancient Greece Declassified, although, so on Twitter and now Clubhouse, I'm at Dr. Lantern Jack, Dr. Lantern Jack. And um, I mentioned Clubhouse because you and I, our listeners should know are now, on that platform and we're hosting um, philosophical conversations, which I do it every week. So hopefully some of our listeners will will tune in and, and actually engage with us on there and discuss these ideas. Yeah, so if you wanna join in the conversation yourself, you know where to find us. Exactly. Perfect. Well, uh, I'll put all the relevant links down below and I will thank you for graciously taking your time out to explain a bit about the invention of duty and uh, the fantastic way that we can live our lives virtuously by following the stoic example. Thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. You can listen to Jack's podcast, Ancient Greece Declassified, at greasepodcast.com.